Welcome back to the High Yield Biochemistry Series. This is brought to you by Dirty Medicine. In today's video, we're going to continue our discussion about the biochemical pathways and talk about glycolysis. Glycolysis is typically the first biochemical pathway that you learn when you're learning about biochemistry. And it's because of that that it's extremely high yield. It shows up on exams all of the time. Now, when you're learning about glycolysis, as you'll see me mention throughout this video, it's really important to remember the bigger picture. And when I say that, I'm referring to things like what is the function or the role of glycolysis? What are we taking as a reactant and turning into a product? And what are the regulatory mechanisms in terms of feedback? So what makes this go forward? What inhibits this? And what is the rate limiting enzyme? Just like all of the biochemistry videos that I've created, you need to know the rate limiting enzyme and the regulatory mechanisms. So we're talking about things like inhibitors, etc. So let's start with a quick overview of glycolysis. Glycolysis is an irreversible biochemical reaction that occurs in the cytoplasm. The net equation for glycolysis is that you start with glucose and the goal is to take that glucose and turn it into pyruvate where it can downstream take multiple pathways through that pyruvate pathway. And preferentially, usually this goes into the citric acid cycle, but here's the net equation. You've t you start with glucose and you add two phosphates, two ADPs, and two NADs. And what you get out of that is two pyruvates plus two ATPs plus two NADH, plus two hydrogens, plus two waters. But if you wanted to just think very simply about what glycolysis is doing, it's taking glucose and breaking that glucose down into storable products that the body can use in other biochemical pathways. So now that we've understood the overview of glycolysis, let's just get into the, the meat and potatoes here. We're going to talk about the pathway. You need to understand the pathway, and I'm going to pay very special attention to the regulatory mechanisms of this pathway and the rate limiting enzyme. So you start with glucose, right? Any person takes a bite of a cheeseburger, eats a french fry, drinks a milkshake, and they've got a bunch of carbohydrate in their body. And that carbohydrate is composed usually of glucose. And if it's not of glucose, then the other types of sugars will get turned into glucose so that glycolysis can utilize it. The first step is glucose will get turned into glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate will get turned into fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose 6-phosphate will get turned into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And now you've got like multiple steps that are going to happen. There's going to be four or five more reactions in this pathway, and you'll end up with phosphoenolpyruvate, which will get turned into pyruvate. And going from glucose down to pyruvate is the entire glycolysis pathway. So when you get to pyruvate, you're basically finished with glycolysis. Now let's talk about the important enzymes that you need to know. So the first step that converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, there's actually two different enzymes that can be used depending on the circumstances or the glucose concentration and where in the body we're talking about. So those two enzymes are glucokinase and hexokinase. So to be perfectly clear, either glucokinase or hexokinase can convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And what you'll need to know for test day that's really high yield is to understand under which circumstances both of these enzymes might be used. So for glucokinase, this enzyme has a low affinity and a high KM. Just remember the reciprocal relationship between affinity and KM. The higher the KM, the lower the enzyme has an affinity for its substrate. So glucokinase has a low affinity for glucose. It typically doesn't want to go and grab glucose. And the reason for this is because glucokinase acts as a glucose sensor. It's present in the liver and the pancreatic beta cells, and it's only used when glucose is at high concentrations. So basically, what you should think of glucokinase as is an emergency enzyme that is acting as a glucose sensor. And it's really not grabbing glucose because instead of grabbing glucose and breaking it down through glycolysis, what it's doing is it's sensing glucose and it's going, okay, let's test how much glucose is over here. Uh, that's okay, we're not gonna jump in yet. Um, hexokinase, you go first. 
So hexokinase, on the other hand, that is a high affinity enzyme, which means it has a low Km. And because it has high affinity for its substrate, hexokinase is the one that's constantly going to be latching onto glucose and converting it to glucose 6-phosphate and sending it down the glycolysis pathway. And the reason for that is because hexokinase is the enzyme that's used to operate the basal glucose metabolism. So constantly throughout your body, in all of your tissues, you have this enzyme, hexokinase, that's just keeping a basal level of glucose metabolism present. It's trying to make sure that your glucose level is adequate throughout the body in all of the tissues. But if hexokinase becomes overwhelmed because suddenly there's a massive influx of glucose, that is when hexokinase turns to glucokinase and says, gluco, I know you usually have a low affinity, but I really need some help now because the glucose concentration is high. So if you think about it, that's the reason that glucokinase is only found in the liver and the pancreatic beta cells, because it does a very specific regulatory job where it's only acting when the blood glucose levels are super, super high. When that concentration reaches some critical point, that's when glucokinase in the liver and the pancreatic beta cells jumps in to save hexokinase. So the takeaway from this slide is that both glucokinase and hexokinase are enzymes that catalyze that conversion from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. The only difference is that hexokinase is kind of there all of the time, making a basal level of glucose, and glucokinase jumps in in emergencies. But understand the differences between those two enzymes that I've put in the gray boxes. They are extremely high yield and probably will show up on your test. So here's where we are. We've, we've talked about the enzymes in the first step. The enzyme that converts fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is the rate-limiting enzyme of glycolysis, and that's phosphofructokinase 1. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as PFK1. So PFK1, or phosphofructokinase 1, is the rate-limiting enzyme, and it converts fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now, I told you at the start of this video that the very important thing to keep in mind for USMLE and COMLEX is the regulatory mechanisms. And what I mean when I say regulatory mechanisms are what inhibits this pathway and what promotes this pathway. And we're gonna talk about that for the first time right here. And because phosphofructokinase one is the rate limiting enzyme, it's really high yield to understand what inhibits phosphofructokinase one and what promotes phosphofructokinase one. And that's what you see here. So ATP and citrate will inhibit the rate-limiting enzyme PFK1, but AMP will promote the rate-limiting enzyme of PFK1. And this should be somewhat intuitive to you. So, so think about what glycolysis is doing. The role of glycolysis is to take glucose, convert it to pyruvate and ATP, and then let that pyruvate enter one of many different pathways, but usually the citric acid cycle where you'll then create citrate. So if you think about that, the question becomes, what would this pathway want to do if it already had ATP and therefore didn't need to make it, or if it already had citrate and therefore didn't need to make pyruvate, which would then go to citrate. And that's why ATP and citrate inhibit PFK1, because if you have ATP and you already have citrate, then you don't need to do glycolysis. So the presence of those products will inhibit the rate-limiting enzyme, and therefore glycolysis won't occur. Now likewise, think about AMP. If you have AMP, which is monophosphate, only one, you don't have ATP. And therefore, if you don't have ATP, you want to do glycolysis. So in the presence of AMP, which is to say in a situation where you don't have ATP, AMP will promote PFK1 and will therefore promote glycolysis. So anytime you're not really sure about how the regulatory mechanisms are working, think about this intuitively. Ask yourself on test day, well, would glycolysis happen if there was AMP? Would glycolysis happen if there was citrate? It should make sense to you if you understand what the big picture role of these pathways are. So that's what promotes and inhibits PFK1. Now I need to pause for a second and tell you about this little nuance of glycolysis. So fructose 6-phosphate can, can go to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate as you see on this slide. But additionally, there's sort of a sidestep that occurs, a pivot if you will. Fructose 6-phosphate can also become 
fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. And if fructose 6-phosphate will become fructose 2,6 bisphosphate, the enzyme that catalyzes this conversion is phosphofructokinase 2, PFK2. So very similarly named, of course, to the rate-limiting enzyme that we just talked about, but instead of one, it's two. So when this happens, you create fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. And interestingly, that fructose 2,6 bisphosphate will promote PFK1. So the goal when the body does this is to make glycolysis happen faster. Now the question then becomes what is promoting or inhibiting phosphofructokinase 2 or PFK2? And that's really simple. So it's going to be inhibited by glucagon and it's going to be promoted by insulin. So think about it. If fructose 2,6-bisphosphate makes glycolysis happen faster and in glycolysis, you're breaking down glucose, it makes sense that insulin will promote PFK2. Because in the presence of glucose, the body's going to secrete insulin, and the body's telling anything that any cell that has a glycolysis pathway occurring, it's like, yo, take that glucose, break it down, please get this out of the system. And that's insulin's role. The opposite of that is glucagon. Glucagon's putting the brakes on this pathway and saying, yo, chill, we need to reverse this and make energy available because blood glucose is low. So think about it, guys. Insulin will promote PFK2 because it will make fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which feeds back to PFK1 and makes this happen faster. But in another situation, glucagon will inhibit PFK2 because PFK2 would normally make fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which would feed back to PFK1 and make this process happen faster. So again, understanding the big picture about what glycolysis is actually doing helps you understand the regulatory mechanisms that you need to memorize for your test. So the takeaway from this slide is that PFK2 inhibited by glucagon and promoted by insulin. The last enzyme that we need to talk about is the enzyme that converts phosphoenolpyruvate to pyruvate, the last step of glycolysis. That enzyme is pyruvate kinase. And just like PFK1, this is going to be inhibited by ATP and citrate for the same exact reasons. And those reasons are, again, glycolysis wants to create ATP, glycolysis wants to make pyruvate, which can then become citrate in the TCA cycle, so therefore, if you already have ATP or you already have citrate, what's the point? You don't need to do glycolysis. So the presence of those products will inhibit the enzymes that usually make glycolysis work. So guys, that's it for glycolysis. And you're probably sitting there starting to have a panic attack thinking about, whoa, whoa, whoa dirty. What about all the other enzymes? Don't, don't worry about the other enzymes. This is what you need to know for USMLE and Comlex. You need to know the enzymes I put in these slides, the regulatory mechanisms that I put in these slides, and understand the difference between glucokinase and hexokinase that we discussed at the beginning of this video. All of the other intermediary steps, you, you don't need to know them. You really don't. They're not going to show up on your test unless you're taking a college level or intro to biochemistry course. You, you really don't need to know them. If you do want to know them for completeness sake, I would encourage you to go online, look at some diagrams, memorize some enzymes, but this is what you need to know to answer 99% of the questions that'll show up on USMLE, Comlex, your question banks, your practice tests, et cetera. So again, and I, I cannot stress this enough because it's the biggest theme for all of biochemistry, know the rate limiting enzyme, know the regulatory mechanisms. And if you get stuck on test day about what's inhibiting or what's promoting, ask yourself, what's the goal of this pathway? And therefore, what do I think might happen? That's it. If you liked this video, drop me a like or a comment in the comment section. Please remember to check my Patreon page. You can click that link in the description of any of my videos. Sign up to send a secure monthly donation and support the channel. Love you. Good luck.